This week's episode is brought to you by MailChimp. MailChimp is an easy-to-use marketing platform with a name that might make it sound like they only do email. But they do just about everything to help your business grow, like ads, postcards, landing pages, audience management tools, automations, reports, and more. You can say MailChimp grew so much they outgrew their name. And their marketing tools can help you do the same. Go to MailChimp.com to sign up for free and see how MailChimp can help you grow your business. MailChimp, they do more than mail. Let's start the show. For Thursday, October 18th, 2018, welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested. Winner. Winner. It really whips the llama's ass. Dot com. Hello and welcome everyone to uh, this wonderful Thursday, October 18th. You know, in uh, Chinese culture, 18 is a very, very lucky number because 8 is a lucky number and 18 sounds like it is like guaranteed luck. Anyway. Really? Yeah. So why don't you know? That seems super scientific. In my Uh, house, the only thing anyone talks about is that it's 14 days from Halloween. Oh, do you have big Halloween plans? 13 by tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. It could be up to 14 days before I'm a father as well. Baby watch day, I don't know, what is this? Week 38? We're no gonna, baby? No baby yet. We'll find out. We'll That's find good. out in less than a week. Baby How's everyone doing? Stay my in for another couple hours. Co-hosts of such lethal cunning. Jeremy Williams, back from a trip. To Seattle, had a great time. That's my review. What? <laughs> All right, we're going to get back to that trip, but Kishore Hari, how you doing? I'm doing well? great. Wearing that repping, repping that Giants cap right now. Even I just though, need to let people know where they are by the logo on my hat. That's right. You're in San Francisco. The, that's what I'm trying to convey. Thanks to Will Smith for sitting in last week. Yeah, yeah. It's good to have Will. Will probably, we'll probably hear and see more of Will in the coming weeks as uh, I will probably not be around as soon as next week. But we know, who knows? Baby Watch may continue <laughs> up through next week. But let's talk about Seattle. Jeremy, you were gone last week because you were on a real holiday. You guys ever been there? Yeah. Yes. I Love like it, it there. I, it, my wife uh, had these train tickets she had to use because she had them, you know, for, uh, a year's in the bank with Amtrak. So we jumped on the train in Emeryville and rode it for 20 hours. The whole family. Yeah, all four of us. We got one of those family cars. We Not, not car, but like room. Mm-hmm. We rode it all the way up there. And uh, we enjoyed the train ride, which we always do. And then we appreciated Seattle. We went there because my wife loves Grey's Anatomy. That's okay, based in Seattle, it is, but shot in LA. Okay, but it, they, they do the exterior shots, you know, in in Seattle. So we whatever we went up there just to find out what is Seattle, and it turns out it's a it's a pretty darn good town, and I wouldn't mind moving there one day. Well, where where did you before visit? it sinks into the ocean? Is it gonna? Yeah. Did Aren't you read it? that big report? Oh, it's horrible. It's, it's on a fault where, like, you know, it's all gonna be beachfront property soon. He's talking about the Catherine Schultz New Yorker piece about yeah. the big yes. um, earthquake that has uh, struck Washington before. But before that, besides visiting hospital facades, what else did you see <laughs> in Seattle? We didn't do the Grey's Anatomy tour, so we have to go back for that. But we we did a uh, underground tour. Like yes. The, the downtown. This is like if there is an earthquake, it won't be the first disaster that has struck Seattle. The the entire downtown area is actually the second floor <laughs> of the original downtown area. I've done this tour. Uh, Did you? I've done. Yeah, it's in um, the what, what's that part of town with the ironworks, the green yeah. you know, iron. But you like literally go underneath. You take the stairwell underneath the city, and they have buildings, storefronts. Yeah, and they talk a, about a, how a bank. Yes, yeah, so the the streets were built there, and then they had to build streets on top of those streets for the horses. Which were one floor above. Like, it wasn't just on top of. Mm-hmm. It was an entire 12 feet above. Yes. And then, so they built the roads first, and then they built the sidewalks. So for four years, in order to get inside buildings and a, walk- across the street, you had to climb a ladder yeah. to cross the street, then descend another ladder. And that was all because of transportation, uh, born out of... I don't... There was... Th- I, they had some disasters. They had some really bad sewage problems. Oh. I don't know. 
anyway, we did that. That was cool. We we went um, kayaking in um, one of the lakes. Wow. Um, and we went to the zoo. We went to the aquarium. But Big aquarium. It's a fine aquarium. I mean, you you know, we we have a few good aquariums around yeah. here too. Yeah. Um, but it's fine. But what I enjoyed the most was the Museum of Pop Culture. Yes. The, formerly the EMP Museum, Experience right? Experience Music Project. Designed oh. by Frank Geary. Somebody told me uh, to, to go find that, and I didn't realize I had. Right next to the Space Needle. Uh, and we will be talking about the Museum of Pop Culture uh, a little bit in depth in our top story. But I also want to hear about the train ride. We will? Why will we? What? It was Paul Allen f- funded the creation well, of that, that museum. Yeah, no, I know. That's true. Okay. But the train ride. Okay. Uh, this the train is, ride? I, I want to hear about the trains, Jeremy. I like the trains. All right. Uh, the Coastal Starlight, this is the one that goes from Seattle to L.A., I believe. Um, tell me about the sights on this train ride. You went, you went both directions? <laughs> just, like train up and train down? There's no sight. I mean, it's, it's the country, man. It's why you take the train. It's just to see the country. It's not like you go to see the sights. I don't think. You know, do you? I mean, you, you go, I mean the sights are is along the route. I'm yes. not talking about the stops along it's, the route. It's just but like, beautiful. It's just, you know, you get to, it's easy going. You you get the, you, they stop periodically, yep. as you know. Yeah. And I find that I sleep better when we're not stopped. You know, chugga chugga choo choo. Over so it was one night. Yeah. So morning, mm-hmm. one one sleep on the train, mm-hmm. and then end of the second day or middle of the second day you get there. Uh, to Seattle is eight o'clock at night. Oh. And we okay. le- we left Emeryville at ten p.m. Ah, okay. So you leave at night, sleep on the train, and you have a whole day. Yeah on the train oh okay yeah it's it's wonderful like you you rode the that line mm-hmm, to la the, the last day that they had this special car the pacific parlor car which is no longer yeah with us yeah do people talk about that car no ah uh, uh. no but it's it, i love the people who work on trains they're all interesting people they're all surprisingly friendly given that they like get no sleep and they have to deal with people all the time did you go to the uh, obs- uh, observation car yeah sure no, i love the observation car yeah if you can get a seat Yes. Yeah, you got to find like go during lunch or something while everyone's and up. you have the meals there too. Yeah, I, I love with the, the family car, car. It's included. Yeah, and it's great. You know, good food. It's fine food. It's better than airplane food. Yeah, it's way better than airplane food. You can get a steak on there. Yeah, I mean, you know, and it it if you have the card, like it's bundled in. Any anyone on the train that was there, just a, a, a train enthusiast or people actually cared about their destination? It's like. Did you find any interesting people on the trains? I would have had to speak to people to find. Oh, uh, you didn't do that. I don't typically do that. Mm. Uh, but I, you know, there were a lot of people there who who weren't in the like the sleeper cars. Right. They just get on the train for cheap transportation, you know, state to state, and oh. they they just take the the regular seats. They sleep in those, and that's a great way to travel. All right. I, I want to do that trip. I want to do that trip to Seattle, and I want to do the trip to Chicago. Now that one. Is that's beautiful? At that's the beautiful trip. Yeah, at least as far as um, the middle of the country, California Zephyr, the five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Very cool. Wait, no, no, no. Top story this week. Why isn't that there? That button should be there. <laughs> Top story this week. I now know how much harder. It is to man the soundboard. So Kishore ran never the sound any last week. criticism. Don't patronize me. <laughs> you just gotta get the the right tech and the right experience. It's just a matter of experience. Uh, okay, speaking of Museum of Pop Culture, um, its uh, benefactor uh, passed away uh, this past week, and among many things, well, it was Paul Allen. It was co-founder of Microsoft. Yeah, uh, who had retired a, a while ago and had running uh, Vulcan, which was his philanthropic arm, uh, also owner of sports teams. He owned the Seattle Seahawks, the Portland Trailblazers, and um, and I, th- I guess it was a kid cancer before. and Three times. And yeah. When it was in remission, and then it came back suddenly. Non-Hodgkin's lymphoma is a, is a terrible disease. Was he 65? Yeah, he was only 65 years old. That's so young. Do you know when he left Microsoft? 1983. What? Yeah. Like way early. What? Wow. Yeah. I guess he just kept his shares and just wasn't hit exactly. there. They went public three years later, I think. Oh. And he's, so yeah. he just wasn't involved in the growth of Microsoft. 
He was involved. Heyday. It wouldn't exist without him. Well, sure, sure. But he wasn't part of that whole 90s era of Microsoft no. and IBM PC growth and dominance. Did, did you read the Bill Gates uh, note about Paul Allen? I thought that was the, the sort of the best remembrance you'll get mm. because he talks about meeting Paul Allen in seventh grade. Like, we don't think about it that way, but they're, they're old middle school buddies. From Seattle or yeah. north of or uh, Washington State. Yeah, and um, he talked about this this time that when they're living near Boston, that Paul Allen picks up a copy of Popular Electronics that shows a chipset on the cover, the the Altair, Altair 8800, yeah. and shows it to Bill. And that's the birth of Microsoft. Gates was at Harvard at the time. Yeah. He's like, this is the computer we've been waiting for. We've got a program for this. And so they did without one. They programmed <laughs> their entire basic demo without the computer. Like on, on paper, on yeah, cards? And... Well, on tape that you feed into it. And then uh, he took it to their demo. Imagine that. Paul Allen did. And, and he called up Bill Gates and he said, you won't believe it, it worked. Uh, I guess <laughs> it's a, the analogous to uh, like a, a app developer working without the, working with an emulator. Sure. I mean, <laughs> it's amazing. But there was no emulator. It's it amazing. Was just, okay. okay. Um, so he, I guess, left Microsoft in the 80s. And what are those big... Like he, he's pursued his, he had all that money. He's pursued his kind of his personal interest at one point forty billion dollars. Yeah, and he was trying to give away all of his money during his lifetime. Wow. And was he, I think he was only able to sort of direct about ten billion dollars of that before he passed away. Uh, his legacy in science is unparalleled. He started the Allen Brain Institute and and some of the big projects there, are like the Brain Atlas to map genes in, in the brain. Um, AI institutes um, popped up all over the place. He he's sort of a giant in neuroscience. He he sort of reshaped that field and set forth a course that that really is so much more aggressive. I think it, it's rare that we say in in science this one person single handedly did you know move the field forward. But that's what Paul Allen did by investing you know hundreds of millions, if not billions, of dollars into science. I didn't know that. And yeah. also started one of the first uh, private uh, space companies, um, which still, I guess, still operates and has been still working on, um, you know, air, air launch to orbit systems, uh, straddle launch. Um, and then related to pop culture was a was a musician. Like a, a d damn good guitarist. Yeah. There was, a, um, um, I guess, a note from uh, Quincy Jones, who mm -hmm. was a friend of Paul Allen's and said he was a amazing guitarist, you know, in the second coming of Jimi Hendrix. And he was a big fan of Jimi Hendrix. <laughs> There's a whole Jimi Hendrix exhibit at the at, Mopop. Yeah, that's a permanent exhibit there with his, his clothing. Um, but the Museum of Pop Culture, I think that's where I connected most with Paul Allen hmm. outside of the software stuff because yeah. he was a fan. He was a huge collector of, and preservationist of um, science fiction, memorabilia, uh, costumes, um, props. And so Museum of Pop Culture has that part of that collection display. Of course, from uh, the music world, guitars, they have that giant sculpture wall of guitars uh, and and just artifacts from classic rock musicians. Uh, and it, it, they have a whole exhibit on, on Seattle bands. Like they have a mm. whole room on Nirvana, you know, right. a whole room on Pearl Jam. But they also have an, an entire science fiction room, which is awesome. It is absolutely, they have so many original costumes in there. They have the original Mork from Orc, Costume, which I got lots of photos from, thinking one year it would make an excellent Halloween costume. Uh, they also have the original Tron costume, like like you know from eighty yeah. eighty three yeah. or whatever. The presentation of I think those uh, those costumes and props is always cycling, and and there's oh, is so it? much in the collection that isn't on display. Yeah, that just like the people who run the museum pull from the collection. You might see something and, new, and you see my and do, they have traveling exhibits that come there as well. Like yeah. they had a bunch of the Marvel costumes on display recently. That one you pay extra for. You pay an mm -hmm. extra five bucks, but it's a ton of screen used costumes. I thought, you, have you guys seen that? Because you guys would flip no, out. No, Bill Duran talked about going there and how they have uh, props and costumes from every film, you know, from Doctor Strange to yes. Iron Man. But the way that they present them is great. Like mm. the Doctor Strange room mm -hmm. is basically a hallway, but it's filled with mirrors that mm. feels otherworldly. Yeah. It's, yeah. So they spend a lot of time on the presentation. Yeah. So uh, thank you, Paul Allen, for what you contributed to both science, the computer industry, and for pop culture and, and sports. And I, it, you know, it's, for, it's sad. for me, I, one of the things that I would first became thankful to Paul Allen for was 
Tech TV, because I moved to Chicago in 2001, which is right around the time Tech TV launched proper. After it was Ziff Davis TV, and then it became this thing on whatever cable. How was he involved? Was. He funded it. It he was funded. it was Vulcan funded. Really? And for for many years, and wow. then it was sold to G4. Yeah. And that's when it started to dip down in quality. But for those years that it was Tech TV, I mean. So Patrick I, Norton. I would love to hear Patrick Norton's thoughts on the passing of Paul Allen because I, I think he probably has a lot to be grateful for, despite the fact that he eventually sold it. Yeah. Wow. Who who today would be the analog? You know, a billion retired billionaire who could fund this type of educational, That's, informational content it's, television. It's so hard because we're having this sort of debate. Like Wired had their 25th anniversary summit this week. And there was a number of billionaires on stage, and there are lots of arguments and debates about... That's a weird thing to say. Yeah, I mean, it is. It is totally a weird thing to say. But they were having debates on, like, what's, like what is the responsibility of bi billionaires to society, mm -hmm. like in philanthropy and stuff. And Paul Allen had a totally different approach than a lot of the these people did. So I'm not sure who that would be. Uh, because he was really in the background. I, I get he put his name on things and he owns sports teams, so he's much more in the public eye. But you didn't hear Paul Allen giving interviews or really being forceful no. uh, about where society needs to go. Um, I, I think he was always the incubator of new ideas. That's all he, I think he ever really wanted to see. Hmm. Uh, just to wrap up this chapter of our podcast, there's a fun thing at the Mopop. Okay. About Marvel, I thought you guys would enjoy. It's choose your favorite Marvel character. Everyone, Thanos. Everyone who walks through <laughs> presses a button. Oh, so it's like an uh, interactive. There exhibit. are so there's over a million, well, el over half a million votes in this thing. Not a million, half a million characters. No, no, no. There's, like there's twenty characters to choose from. All right, La Lamb on uh, me. I mean, give, give me. Uh, who do you think yeah. is number one? Spider Man. Spider Man. It is Spider Man. How did you know that? Because oh. we're comic fans. We know <laughs> with. Uh, who did you think was number one, Jeremy? I I would have had no idea. Like I would have thought Iron Man because the movies are so popular. No, um, it is Spider Man with one hundred and forty two thousand six hundred thirty two votes. You know, it's I don't not, think kids read comic books relating to alcoholic billionaires. <laughs> Probably relate more to the kid from Brooklyn who was who was a who was a nerd and beat up and got amazing Spider. That's powers. cool, but it's not one of the Disney films. And so I thought maybe because of the MCU it, that would have that would have controlled now, that well, would have controlled it. Spider Man two thousand one. What the that, that was the first film to break hundred million dollars at the box office. So that right. kind of marketing research right. alone lets you know that Spider Man it was, is the most popular. I did who, not have this comic. research. At, at <laughs> who do you think is? Who do you think's number two? Then Norm? did you look? Captain America. I haven't looked. Okay, I would have gone Iron Man. Well, two. it was my vote. I voted, and then you find out who, who what the list is. Oh, okay. But my vote was Black Panther. That's number two. Wow, oh, surprisingly fantastic. number two. Now tell me that's not related to the movie. I think that's one hundred percent related to the movie. Okay, but but totally interestingly, that's good. Interestingly, less than a hundred votes behind Spider Man. What? Yeah. That's no amazing. way. Isn't that amazing? That's some good marketing right there that they've done. 142,586. And these are for people who've paid to go through the exhibit. Yes, exactly. All right. And then you've got Groot, Iron Man, Captain America. Groot? Groot is three? <laughs> what? Oh, figure, man. This is Kids these days. This is movie. This is definitely movie. And then I'll just skip to point. the end. Who's, who's at the end? You saw it. Who's at the end? Wait, wait, hold no, on, hold I didn't on. actually okay. look at that. Ant-Man? No, no, no. Not even last uh, one. No, it, wait. How many characters did we have? Oh, this is uh, you, you, Human you're, Torch. The last five is way more interesting than the top five. So are Ant these... Ant-Man's not even a contender. He's not even in the list. He's not even in the list in 20... No. How many characters? 20, 20, you said? yeah. So it's not MCU dictated. These are just no, comic right. no, characters. Uh, no, this is a comic book. You're, it's true. They do have costumes from the films, but yeah, it's a comic. Do you want to list through... You know, no, 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 no. Okay. You should okay, know. Hold on, hold on. I, I go Human Torch or Iron Fist. Those are my... Yeah, are, are those on the list? No. They gotta be. Oh, they're, either. They're, not. they're neither. No Fantastic Four members on the list. Oh, because Fantastic Four, huge. Like, Iron I'm Fist huge isn't fan on of, there. Of Reed Richards, uh, I would think that kids nope. would be a huge fan of the Thing, uh, or or even uh, Johnny Storm, rock star Johnny Storm. Um, huh. Let what me just think? tell you. No, no. I want. I, I want to <laughs> guess. I want to guess. <laughs> and uh, people love Rocket Raccoon. She Hulk, not on the list. Uh, uh, Doctor Strange, no. No, Doctor Strange has got to be up there. Doctor Strange is number six. Oh, so wow. So last place with not not just a couple of votes, 16,000. No, no, no. Go thousand. With fifth to last place. Okay, fine. Fifth to last place. Go to In number 16, Gamora. I'm so sorry, Kishore. That's a, that's a tough break for her. Uh, 17, Daredevil, which is kind of surprising given 
Uh, he's he's kind not of a terrible. Kid show. I love Daredevil. Eighteen Falcon. Mm. I don't know who that is. What Falcon? Falcon is in the movies. He's in the movies. You've he's seen Cap's best friend in the movies. That's not Bucky. What? Whatever. Well, oh my. God. Now, Cap, number nineteen. <laughs> now this is going to change. Captain Marvel. Yeah, oh, yeah, that'll change. Oh yeah, that that'll be the Black right? Panther moment isn't, next year. Isn't that well, interesting? That's, that'll be number two and number twenty with six, sixteen thousand seven hundred seventy-three votes, one percent of all voters. Luke Cage. Luke Cage is on there, and Iron Fist isn't on this list. Yeah, heroes. That's for not hire. right. You don't hire That's just right. one hero; it's heroes for hire. <laughs> Hey, Norm, way to break YouTube yesterday. I know. We dropped the episode of Still Untitled, and then minutes later, <laughs> YouTube went down. Uh, has this ever happened? I'm sure what it has. People do? I, I just I, don't remember it. Happening. I followed this on Twitter, and, and it happened at a very inopportune time, not because we just we dropped an episode of Still Untitled, but because it was also uh, not only did YouTube go down, but YouTube TV went down as well, and it was the first night of the NBA season, so presumably, and they had funded it a huge campaign for people uh, to watch NBA on YouTube TV. So presumably a lot of people who wanted to watch the, the Celtics 76ers game could not. But if you followed on Twitter, people were freaking out. YouTube, like, where did they go? Maybe they there's an opportunity for Twitch to seize up that audience. Even, well, the, even the Verge wrote an article. Yep, YouTube is down. YouTube is down. <laughs> I mean, I would normally com. search YouTube videos for why YouTube is down. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think YouTube turns stuff around that quickly. It's funny how, more Twitch thing. how that breaks the internet because Tested's entire site looked wrong. Yeah, because, because the embed, oh, the f- all of the embeds. 500 error. Yeah, many websites that use YouTube embeds all uh, went down. Uh, and it, it was kind of freaky. It's like that, that is equivalent of like NBC or ABC going down in the 60s. Like a whole television <laughs> network going than down. That. YouTube's bigger than that now. I, I, I know, but like at the scale of like back then when there were only half a dozen television stations and yeah. everyone watched those stations, you know, NBC going down during a, a Cronkite, you know, report, that would be a big thing. Yeah. It would be a unifying moment. What's weird is we, at, at least when we're recording this, we still don't know why. Yeah. They yeah. haven't released any information about yeah. it. Oh, it should be a fly on the wall at the YouTube headquarters. Oh, no. That would not uh, be a happy place no, to be. No. <laughs> people would be freaking out. I wonder. I want because you, you know, you just got to do your job. Yeah. But how do, you, how do you troubleshoot something like that? Yeah. I'm sure they have systems in place. And what right? was it? Do you think it was nefarious? No. Yeah. Oh, like part of me in the moment, because it was, a, it was down for more than minutes. We're talking about like half wow. an hour, right? Yeah. Almost an hour. Uh, I was like, is this, is this Die Hard 4? Is this the first step toward the, uh, the big attack? YouTube goes down first, mm-hmm. and then Facebook, then Twitter, all these communication mediums going down. How do people stay informed? You gotta flip on your television. Oh no, you run YouTube TV. Not good. Google does all their own hosting, right? They don't outsource any of that. Yeah. They're on yeah. the backbone. No, they're not they're not on they are the back they have a backbone. Yeah. Right. They they're not on S three. They're not on Amazon's. Yeah, I, I just want to know like who had to send like a message to like Susan Wojcicki being like, uh YouTube is down. <laughs> <laughs> like, how do you tell like somebody in charge? It, it, it's not like the data is gone, right? No. I, I think people who are in the middle of watching videos were still able to finish their videos. Yeah. It was more about the indexing and the pulling of the videos um, that didn't work. Everyone asked how much is Google losing every minute in revenue from right. this, but I wondered how much are they saving because they don't have to pay for all those streams anymore. They make more than they save. They haven't done that for long, if that's the case. Like it used to be, it used to be. You think YouTube is not profitable? It might be now, but it, as early as a few years ago, it certainly wasn't. Oh, I think they care more about the, the money they would give back to advertisers, or the money they wouldn't have to spend. Oh yeah, to you know, the advertisers wouldn't be spending on the inventory that's not there. Uh, I can, I was wondering, like, would this be a moment for someone to seize on this and like launch their big, you know, YouTube alternative, or you know, get people hooked on another platform and and take away any market share? But just looking at our our numbers, the moment it came back, everything looked back as normal, like back to normal. The, everything stayed the same. But your graph must have a big. The dip graph in has it. a big dip for yep. those two hours. Uh, at least they're accounted for. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. YouTube's not going to give you those views back. 
Thanks, YouTube. A little black hole. Thanks, YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, some other uh, bits. Uh, are we in pop culture news? Yeah, this is, I guess yeah. it's a mixture of pop culture and tech news. Um, let's talk about uh, big, uh, another passing of a giant mm. this, this, uh, this week. Uh, Sears is going under. Sears has filed for bankruptcy and will be shuttering its stores, uh, I think, by the end of this year. Well, it, they just filed Chapter 11, so that's not Chapter 7 where everything is being liquidated. So there's a chance they'll emerge from bankruptcy and, and keep some stuff open, but a it's large... not looking good. No, things don't look good. Where will people get their refrigerators and ovens serviced? My, my mom just did that. Like at Sears? Like they're in her garage, yeah. Yeah. Or actually, she, they, actually, they haven't been delivered yet, <laughs> so oh, no. may, maybe she better get on that. <laughs> yes. Um, that's real sad. I mean, Sears, as an as a institution, like one of the last of the big box department stores um, that people would still go to that would be f- connected to malls. It's, it's mall culture dying. I mean, we saw this. Yeah, Anchor. Yep. They haven't turned a profit since 2011. Oh. So this is not exactly like a, a surprise uh, that we got to this point. It's sort of remarkable that they hung on for as long as they have, given that. Uh it, it's kind of discussion but, fodder for um, you know MBA students in, in business school, right? Like, how would you modernize a department store like Sears? But if you go through all the the ways they could have done, all the money they could have spent on online presence, it's in, almost inevitable, right? Like, it who was it the the uh, the retail chief of Apple that left to to run um, uh, what was it uh, J C Penney? Right, couldn't save J.C. Penney, and couldn't like what? What is going to get people in stores? The it's so hard when your brand is tied up with years and years of of, of sort of impressions because it's really hard to shift it. Uh, but they are like physical warehouses, like that's what what retailers are these days, and the ones that can adapt and use their their retail locations as in that model of a warehouse may be able to salvage some things. It's like everyone thinks of Apple as being the case study for the successful retail experience, but how can you tell? How can you tell that they're successful because of the retailer? The retail is even successful. If you, if you have it, if they sell, you know, items that are available online just as easily and are innately successful without the help of retail. No, it, but like the Apple store isn't isn't so much like a place you purchase stuff. As much as it is a place you tr- like demo stuff, right? You demo stuff, and also it's a local pickup location. Mm-hmm. That's what it is. You don't go there to shop or or to get service, right? It's a service and pickup, or site. to learn. Um, they do have those sessions. That yeah, you can I sign think for. that's such a small part of that business. Yeah. Like, how many people can you fit through those sessions? Um, actually, my parents did one recently, and you know they, they found it enjoyable. That's not a money maker. They don't them. charge for them. Well, I mean, I, I, as a as a growth thing, like yeah. the idea of building a community. Of Apple people, it's the, yeah. I don't think that's the crux of it. What I think is hard about this sort of Sears bankruptcy, which also affects Kmart, which is part of its holdings, is there's a lot of small towns in this country where that's the store. Like there's a Kmart, a Kmart in the in the town, and so losing that option is actually going to be you know pretty a big deal for that town. Mm-hmm. And so it'll be interesting to see how smaller towns, like for us living in a big city, it's not really, it doesn't have any effect on us. When's the last time you went into a Sears? No. Walmart, is that still? You go into the, you walk fine. through, you walk through the Sears, right? To get to the place in the mall you want to go because to. Because you parked outside. Because you it? parked outside of the Sears. Yeah. You walk it, through the Sears. It is a weird part of Americana going away. Just like Woolworth and Montgomery Ward and. Radio Shack. Yeah. Montgomery Ward. You you called it out on Still Entitled this week, didn't you? Yeah. Now I remember. I'm, I'm thinking of the local mall that we have in, in the south of San Francisco. Had a Sears and a Montgomery Ward and a Macy's. Macy's is basically gone. What does that mean for for holiday shopping? It's just, it's all online. It's all delivery. It's all logistics delivery, which is still heavily undervalued. And, and, and we don't pay enough for. And those people are way overworked. UPS and FedEx employees and uh, USPS employees what about the amazon first party delivery service oh yeah the w- huge undervalued right the, the on track people and yeah no they're first party people the, the peop- first party people? The people in the white van well, who, are, least, who are hired directly by amazon to be their first party carriers 15 dollars an hour which in some most places they that whole business needs to be rethought because yeah. i from what i understand they are not properly incentivized to 
treat your packages right, mm -hmm. they leave them outside of my door all the time. Yep. Is, is that a business that's going to go away? Uh, go away with robots, self-driving cars, and robots. Why isn't Amazon investing in 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 this in I, autonomous vehicles? There's certainly vehicles. good solutions. Like Chevrolet has a service where if you have OnStar and a certain car, it'll you, open. It'll open the trunk right. when Amazon arrives. So creepy though. This is a place for, and we're moving the tech. It is a place for a car company like Chevrolet or you know obviously a Tesla to move into, right? Because if the idea is that they can have AI systems and self-driving car systems that can be competent enough to keep the cars on the road, solving a huge parking problem and potentially a traffic problem with the smart navigation and awareness of all the other cars, then those cars being on the road got to be doing something. And if they're not giving people rides and being part of a transportation system for people, they can be part of a transportation system for goods and packages. I don't understand why we have a mail system and everyone's developed like a series of mail boxes. Why don't we have like a box system for packages yet? Like where every house has like a package repository in front. There's no standard size. Space. I think it makes more sense for for like the 7-Elevens of the world to have those lockers. That was that But was then the, you still have to go somewhere to that's get your the, thing. The last mile I think is less of a problem. Right. I mean no no and, and to be clear, again we're talking about big cities, right? In the in in most of the country, you know, it's more than just last mile, it's last 15 miles to get somewhere. But again, it's all relative. It's easier than driving 30 miles to get to your local UPS center to pick something up. We're very lucky that we can just go, you know, a mile to get to our local UPS place to pick something up. Um, what about the catalog? The Sears catalog? Yeah, that's okay. You guys, were, were you ever into that stuff? As, as, just as a, a kid, sure. As an artifact? I mean, like, just like, it's catalog spark your kids' imaginations. Kids do like catalogs. Halloween costumes. They right? Like, yeah. Right? Christmas toys. And, and it's not the same scrolling through Amazon or scrolling through any online retailer. You know, you don't have that. You can't cut it out. You can't clip it out. There's the tangibility, I think, of it is, is important to, to the, what the promise that the catalog offered. Yeah. It's curated. It, it's, well, it's curated in the same way that it's designed. Yeah. Yeah, right. Curated probably placement was probably paid for, right? The things they wanted to sell the most and yeah. you know, if you want to look through, through everything. But it was it's a menu, a menu of dreams. <laughs> RIP RIP Sears. I'm getting uh, wistful about it. All right. Uh other things in pop culture. Hey, did you guys see this video? Uh the Gizmodo I don't know posts about uh embedded um someone took footage from Solo mm -hmm. and ran it through a uh deep learning AI to create a deep fake with Solo replacing the actor with Harrison Ford's face. I watched this. It looks surprisingly good. It does. I don't know, man. I, I think this looks good because some dude did it with a deep fake AI thing he got from GitHub. I don't think it l would look good in a theater. No, no. And I don't think anyone's arguing that, but it puts onto screen and manifests the, 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 you know, the, the fan fiction of what it would look like for yes. a young youngish Harrison Ford. Yeah. Uh, because some people really cling to the idea that they wanted, they, they, they want their actors, they want their characters to look like the original actors. You know, more so than, no one does this for Spock. And we talked about Spock in the past couple of weeks, because Spock, of course, is going to come to Star Trek Discovery, and there's been, you know, Spark as an iconic character is now going to be portrayed by an, an adult form by three actors. Um, but no one's going, make, give me a deep fake, a young Leonard Nimoy onto the Spock face in, in Star Trek and J.J. Abrams' Star Trek. Mm -hmm. But people really care about Harrison Ford being. Do you think this is going to enable yeah, bad solo. fan behavior? Uh, I think the, the act of creating pop culture. That's any the nostalgia base enables bad fan behavior, and and it may doesn't necessarily encourage it, but the bad fan behavior is going to come out no matter what, and that's just rather unfortunate. I think as a technological exercise, I think it's super interesting, and it it's a very real example of just how powerful these uh, deep learning AIs and deep fake technologies can be. Why is this so positive when we just came off of um, Rogue One, where we had Princess Leia at the very end of it? And uh, everyone was up in arms about it. Because it didn't look good. Mm -hmm. Well, did, did it look better than this? I think... Or as good? Uh, when yeah, you say but that's positive, a I think the, the this is some guy. No, no one's giving this a thumbs up, right? I think the thumbs up that people are giving this is the novelty of that. this... Uh, what Kishore said, this being some guy. Mm -hmm. And two, this being 
uh, algorithmically generated as opposed to hand okay. hand massage. All right. And you make you make a case that like the hand massaging part is kind of essential. You know, even with performance capture, like all the animations captured by face, that's still tweaked by artists. Mm. And you know, maybe that's held just to a higher standard, which is why the um, the critical feedback in in um, in Rogue One uh, was a little harsh. I wonder if if what's the actor's name who played Han Solo? Anyone know Alden Ehrenreich? Aaron Reich or Aaron Reich? Your brain is amazing. It's really amazing. Uh, uh, not if you listen to this past episode of Sound <laughs> Title. I, I f- stressed out for five minutes, which felt like fifty minutes to remember the name of one actor. I wonder if he knew, like, if they had, if they did this in the film, and if he knew that they were going to do it in the film, how that would affect his acting. If you knew, oh, then you're not hired. Eventually, that's not what you're hired to do. That well, maybe because they they capture all the same expressions. It's like an Andy Circus performance. Oh, but they, would they use his voice? I don't, sure. I don't know. But I think... Like, they used Andy's. You know, I, I just wonder if that frees him up in some... If he's that kind of actor that would be free to emote better or act differently if you knew that your face wasn't actually going to be seen. I think that there's a stigma still for performance acting. Yeah. And that the surely the, the burden of responsibility would be shared by the effects artists and the te- technicians who are, would work on that post-processing. Uh, uh, I think the procedure, uh, 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 yes, the answer is yes. I think he would be he would feel less pressure, but it would also be less of, he, he would feel like it would be less of his performance. Hmm. Um, and so I, 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 I'm glad they didn't go that way. I don't want to see films go that way. Yeah. There are places where I think it makes sense. Like for example, Arnold Schwarzenegger, what they did in Terminator Genesis, was they mm. they had a young Arnold Schwarzenegger and they just imposed, superimposed the face of young Arnold, purely CG, with on, on a, a, a bodybuilder. I'm not sure, but maybe it was an Austrian bodybuilder, but another bodybuilder um, on the one scene. And it looked good, but they were going for a very specific thing then where they needed to have the young face. Was that like Jeff Bridges in uh, Tron Legacy? I'm not exactly sure. We also talked about this in, in some titles as well. I don't know how they did that one. They have, I don't know if they did um, Sounds similar. performance capture of Jeff Bridges himself oh, yeah. and then massage that and look younger, uh, which is also different than like a Michael Douglas playing a young Michael Douglas in Am and the Wasp or Sam Jackson um, doing the same thing um, in upcoming Captain Marvel. Like, you mentioned this before, but I think that's going to be the most interesting test case that we have the upcoming Captain Marvel movie because we're assuming we're going to get like full movie yeah. de-aged Sam Jackson, right? As opposed to most of these endeavors are like you know thirty seconds, a minute, something like that, yeah. where some of that's forgivable. And in the case of you know Sam Jackson and Michael Douglas playing their younger selves in these Marvel films. I think you're right. That is the more interesting question because they do have their performance relaxed because they know they're just acting like themselves and they're portraying themselves. They're not losing any of their own essence or quality. It's just extra makeup. It's like acting under a mask, but it's still you still know it's it's them. Whereas when you're talking about a performance actor coming in and hired to be the body essentially, and to but the audience receives it as another character. That's a feels like a whole different job. Uh, for better or worse, and and um, Andy Serkis has a lot to say about this stuff because performance actors don't get enough credit, and they are acting still. You know, there's, there's a lot of physicality to it. Yeah, here, here. Um, all right. On more in the Marvel universe, uh, sudden news that Iron Fist has been canceled by Marvel. Thank goodness. This is the Netflix show, of course. It had two seasons. Um, I don't think any of us in this room has watched the second season. I but- watched the first ten minutes. Of, of the second season? Of the second season. Hmm. And I was like, I'm out. Now, the reviews have been positive, and that may be because they're in contrast to Iron Fist in the first season and also his portrayal in The Defenders, since that was such an essential character in The Defenders. But apparently the second season does end on a really interesting note, and fans of the show, however many there are, are a little disappointed that they won't get to see that story continue. Uh, now... The statement that's come out of Marvel and Netflix, and I'm sure they had the, the numbers to justify this cancellation, is that every this is the end of one chapter, and there's, you know, in, in so many words, this may not be the end of Iron Fist. And so if there gets to be a Defenders 2, or maybe he gets rolled into a Luke Cage Season 3 for Heroes for Hire, like these are all potential extensions of the character uh, they just won't have the responsibility or the privilege of carrying the whole story in their own show, which 
is, I think, a sad fact because the character is so interesting. I'm bummed. I, I you know what? I hope that Marvel <laughs> will just reboot Iron Fist. The the acting was really bad. The writing was bad. Yeah, so uh, that's just stuff you don't recover from. The like, martial arts were bad. Yeah, these like those are the three things that that character needs. And the things that Daredevil did well: the martial arts, the acting, and the writing. Uh, yeah, and the cinematography. Yeah, yeah. This, this felt like B Squad, a little bit. My pitch for Iron Fist: reboot the character, go back to its martial arts roots. Give me a Crouching Tiger style movie with the Iron Fist character. Yeah. That's what I want. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Black Panther 2 mm -hmm. has locked down writer-director Ryan Coogler. Sweet. Um, and Hollywood Reporter uh, said that this is something that probably was negotiated a while ago, but it's now finally being confirmed and made public. And I think that we were all Hope expecting that. Hope he got paid. That. Yeah. Hope oh, he yeah. got paid. Why, he wasn't paid for the first one? Well, I'm sure he wasn't paid what he generated because that movie made more money than uh, domestically than Infinity War. Like, yeah. it was like a m way out to expectations. And really, when you look at his library of films, there it's it's epic. He deserves to get paid for what he did with Creed, what he did with Fruitvale Station. Like, get paid, son. <laughs> yeah. And I'm glad that he's not only coming back to uh, direct it, but also to write it. Um, because it, I, th I feel like it's just as much his story as it is Chadwick Boseman's story and uh, the Black Panther story. Um, when is it slated for release? I think uh, I think it's 2020. And, yeah, there's um, no details that like a script is finished or anything like that mm -hmm. at this point. I mean, the expectation for Marvel fans and MCU fans is that after Infinity War Part Two, whatever it's named, Avengers... Eternity? Sure. Avengers, Death of Captain America. Well, the, 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 ah! the leading to the at the end of that film, the old guard, if you will, mm -hmm. will retire somehow. Mm -hmm. Either they will buy the farm or they'll be put out to pasture or they'll walk off into the sunset somehow. Mm -hmm. Right? Chris Evans posted recently, great privilege in uh, performing as Captain America for eight years, but he has made it clear that it's his... Last film was Captain America. So who carries the mantle? And who, not only of Captain America, but who carries the Marvel mantle? Uh, and so the assumption is... If only they had a character forthcoming Captain that Marvel. had a Marvel-type yeah. name. Hmm. Imagine that. Captain Marvel and back Black Panther could be the Iron Man, uh, Captain America of the next phase of the Marvel Universe. 13-year-old me can't believe this is happening. And they, they, what a perfect fit that would be, right? I think in many ways, Black it's Panther is like Iron Man, you know, hero in a suit, you know, technological genius. And Captain Marvel is hopefully like Captain America when, in, with the ideals that the, 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 uh, the MCU carries. Does it's, she have a shield? No shield. Oh. But in terms of being the, you know, the, at the head of the mountain, yeah. the one to lead the way. The moral like, compass. Yes, Marvel, there's still time to change it to Avengers, Thanos reigns. Do it. Do the right thing. A <laughs> <laughs> uh, couple other bits of news. Uh, Carol Spinney, who has been playing Big Bird. Since I was a kid. Yeah. Um, and still currently plays Big Bird on Crazy. HBO's Sesame Street, is retiring. He's 84. He's been playing this character for decades. Holy cow. Uh, like, I... I kind of can't believe it. Big Bird's retiring. I mean, like, the character's still going to remain. They're not going to kill off Big Bird from Sesame Street. Thank goodness. That would be that would cause, like, uh, quite the backlash. But I can't believe it. I saw Carol Spinney at, um, at Dragon Con recently. Did he, he was, do the voice still? Oh, I don't know if he does the voice. Uh, I imagine it'd be one of those circumstances where they put out the offer, if he still does do the voice, to continue doing the voice while another puppeteer can can do the, the physical task of yeah performing as Big Bird. But as we know from speaking to puppeteers and uh, Muppeteers, uh, the they, they see them as one of the same. The I would imagine so. And the, the, uh, the hand motions and the, the body form. So they wouldn't want to just do one and not the other. Yeah. So end of an era. 50 years he's, he will have played Big Bird by the time he retires. Wow. And 4,000 episodes. 
Wait, 50 years next year? Uh, well, yeah. I, I, that's Yes, he started when he was 34. Wow. All right. Um, the last bit of movie news. Uh, did either of you watch World War Z? Negative. No. Did you read the book? I read the book. The book was hmm. hugely popular in, uh, I want to say the late aughts, mid to late aughts, uh, right at the rise of zombies being in pop culture. And the film has a stored history of production where they basically chopped off the last third of the film and rewrote it and refilmed it. Mm-hmm. And I think it's a good film. Um, they're finally moving with the sequel and Brad Pitt will team up now with longtime collaborator David Fincher to direct a sequel. So I'm very excited. So it's actually going to be a sequel. It's not going to be like some sort of reboot. This is a very yeah. different zombie film. It's like fast zombies. And like yes. stylistically, the, the book is really... Um, very different. I actually really like the book. Well, the structurally, the book is yeah. not really made to be adapted into a film because Max Brooks, who wrote the book, um, you know, Max Brooks being Mel Brooks' son, uh, his whole thing is he he his professional writing job is preparing for disasters. Like he is part of a think tank in which he comes up with interesting ways that the world can collapse economically. Um, in agriculture and in, in militarily and that kind of thinking, that kind of backward thinking of like the way in which the world is fragile and the way in which all our systems are inter interconnected and YouTube. one system can bro- break down, like just like YouTube, like that was all manifest in World War Z with zombies. So World War Z, if you haven't read it, highly recommend it because it, it's like if you were kind of like like picking apart, if you like the Martian and you like like kind of deconstructing of of a, a problem, right? This is being the problem of, of zombies in, in world governments. Um, that I think they they scratch the surface of that barely in the first World War Z movie, and hopefully they'll have a little more of that. I don't care about the fast zombies versus so slow zombies. Is it thing. a sequel or I think it's a, it's a continuation of the story. It's a continuation, yeah, because they don't win the war in the first film. Is yeah. Brad Pitt in it? I think he is in it. How about that? Yeah. Yeah. Are we done with zombies culturally? I was done with zombies before there were zombie films, man. I, I don't get it. I understand why they're great computer antagonists because AI makes for a great zombie. Right. Simple. Dumb. But very. S- I don't understand, like, the. let's imagine that there's a zombie apocalypse. I don't, I don't get into that. It was, I think people, it was like they brought the prepper in everyone. Right. It brought the what? Brought out the prepper. Okay. Yeah. Right. Like, people what would like you do? exactly yeah. like, like the, that fantasizing. That's what this book does. The fantasizing of like, how prepared are you? Yeah. Right. The, the invisible monster that will never be real. People like to imagine they are prepared for it. Um, and, and yeah, I, I'm done with zombies. Also. <laughs> yeah. I mean, Walking Dead has uh, the ratings have dropped to season series lows, in the recently, and yet they still want to push for another ten years. Yeah, I'm just glad. I mean, they're doing Zombieland too, and that's a fun, okay film. I think that a was overrated. Um, and yeah, there's just a lot of zombies. Thriller was pretty good though. You remember that music video? <laughs> that was pretty good. John Landis. Yeah. Um, I watched a couple movies over the past week. I'll go do real quick reviews as I did on Still Entitled. Venom. Oh yeah. Three out of five. Really that high? I think I I, I enjoyed it more than. That I thought it would. Is I that guess. a thumbs up? That's a thumbs up, right? That's a fresh tomato. Uh, I guess that is a fresh tomato. 60%? Wow. Is 60% a fresh tomato? Yes, I think that's right. a cutoff. I think it's a solid 60%. Yikes. 60 for me. Eat Which it. is not, that's not, <laughs> no, it's not glowing. Eat it today because it won't be fresh tomorrow. No, exactly. Exactly. Uh, uh, it's funny. And um, while having no connection to Spider Man, I think it serves me fine. I think um, uh, Tom, uh, Tom Hardy performing both the characters of Venom and Eddie Brock and having these silly and fun conversations with himself, essentially. That duality plays out well in the film. That's all really, it turns out all I really needed. Yeah. Is so, Spider-Man mentioned? Not even. How about that? Yeah. Okay. It's, there's nothing to do with Spider-Man hmm. at, at all whatsoever. Nothing, not, not even like, a, like one of those background TV mentions, yeah. like Web Slinger in New York kind of thing. No, hmm. no Easter egg. Set in San Francisco. Uh, Bad Times at El Royale. This is uh, Drew Goddard's first film since Cabin in the Woods. I was oh. very excited about this. Wow. He wrote, co-wrote the Martian screenplay, and he uh, uh, works showed on, Daredevil. Works on The Good Place? Uh, works on The Good Place. Wasn't J.J. Abrams associated with the Cabin in the Woods? 
uh, Joss Whedon. He oh, comes right, out right. of the That's Joss right. Whedon school, did Angel and that kind of stuff yeah, beforehand, yeah. co-wrote uh, or wrote Cloverfield, I believe. Um, this is uh, not as good as Captain in the Woods, hmm. but um, it's a solid, uh, just like a Tarantino-like film with hmm. a lot of interesting characters, a slow burn. Oh, I thought it would be like Identity. Do you remember that movie? Oh, with John Cusack? Yeah. With the twist? I'm going to spoiler twist. If you haven't seen Identity, they're all the same person. I also got that vibe where there'd be like a supernatural twist or some type of thing. But no, it's pretty straightforward. People have secrets. They find themselves in an interesting place. I think the premise is more, is more interesting than the movie. The premise being that seven characters meet up at a hotel that's on the border between California and Nevada where there's a line that are drawn down between the hotel. They built the whole hotel out because they couldn't find a place to shoot it. And um, you can live on the California side or the Nevada side. They don't have a liquor license in Nevada, so you can only drink on the California side. Mm. Th- I thought that premise was cool. It's very pulpy in that way. Um, and then, of course, First Man, which we talked about in Stone Title. We'll have a, um, an episode of Offworld next week where Adam talks more, more in depth about it. Did either of you get a chance to see it? No. I've seen it. You saw no. it. I saw the reviews are quite good. You should totally watch it. Jeremy, if you do get a chance to see it, my recommendation is watch it in IMAX. Okay, yeah. Um, I can see that. There are some scenes where they really open up the aspect ratio. And they film with IMAX cameras. Oh, I hate that, though. You don't like that? No. Give me one or the other. It takes me out. So, I mean, Damien Chazelle you, What talks, if they edit in a way that you don't notice? We'll see. I mean, he talked about, like, that was a really specific choice because he wanted to feel like a documentary. So that's why he filmed in 16. And then, like, but when you get to certain places that you want to be expansive, spoiler alert, the moon, <laughs> <laughs> uh, he, he kind of pops it out to IMAX. So. I mean, it's not like they, like, like, like the curtains pull up. And like the frame opens it, up, it just is one shot is in yeah. twenty one by nine, and the next shot is in whatever IMAX is in, you yeah. know, close to four by three. And when you have shots that are basically black around the top and bottom because of space, you know, you just I, I think it's pretty seamless. Uh, those are the, all the movies I want to talk about and other pop culture things. So let's move on to. Well, I had a thing. Oh, okay, I'm sorry, Jeremy. <laughs> it's it's I don't know if it's not. Uh, I don't know if it's a good topic or not, but I, I I was been listening to an audiobook. Like on Twitter, I ha- realized I had all these six credits for um, Audible.com, so I yep. asked all of the wonderful listeners of the podcast and my followers to suggest books, and I picked six. And the first one I dove into is a book I have to recommend to you guys. Um, it's called We Are Legion. Oh, we, the Bob. We Are Bob. Yeah. Have you seen? Have you read this? There, I actually just bought them on Audible, but you did not. Uh, there's a whole trilogy of them. Yes. Yeah. You? No. Let's 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 do this. Let you check it out. See if you get into it. Maybe it'll take you a month or two. But whenever you're done, let's regroup here because I want to talk about this book. It's it's got elements of The Martian. It's got elements of uh, like a little bit of Ready Player One. Not necessarily like the nostalgia factor, but like a little bit of '80s '90s going on. But it's uh it's it's well worth your time. It's uh. It would it be a twist to give off the premise that it's about putting... Well, I don't think so. The, a man is put into cryo and wakes up as an AI. He is reincarnated inside a computer. And the We Are Bob aspect comes from this notion of von Neumann probes. So he's sent off into space and, and self-replicates. And it's it's profound what happens with the with the replicants in some ways, but it's also just really, really good science fiction that is well thought out and the idea of immortality as an AI and what does that mean and all of the implications. These are exactly the kind of fun things that, um, you know, backseat futurists love to love to think about. That's me. That's me. I'm a backseat futurist. I think that's, that's, yeah. Apologies for trailing off. Any text message I get from Danica is a oh, you is like a flag panicked. Right it's, up now. To, it's up to me and Kishore to finish off the show. They're, they're, it, that very well could be a possibility. <laughs> we could we could always get Phil Schiller to pop in. He's doing that now. <laughs> a Schiller note. Does yeah. he come on podcast now? No, he just shows up at presentations. Yeah. sometimes was he at Wire Twenty Five as well? No, he was at Adobe Max though. Ah, oh, mm. nice segue because Adobe Max was this week a big Adobe conference where they not only talk about Creative Cloud but Future uh, features that they have been experimenting with, some of which never make the market, but are interesting because they have a lot of researchers and they are kind of at the forefront of what the computer vision, what they've been doing for a long time is 
computer vision, not necessarily in, in real time, but you know, in their software. Uh, one of their uh, experiments is uh, called uh, Smooth Operator. <laughs> cool name, really cool name. But in fact, uh, this may be cringy for some of you because it is a way to turn 16 by 9 video into 9 by 16 video. I think the the difference is it auto crops it for you. That's a, It is exactly it. If you film whether it's in 1080 or 4K, a landscape video, uh, this is an AI system that will run through that video, maybe subject track, and use some of its AI to figure out what's the interesting points of the video and crop it for portrait viewing on, presumably, cell phones. Isn't the problem we really need the opposite? Don't we need to take vertical video and interpolate the rest so we get horizontal (laughs) video? (laughs) How do you there's do no that? Way, there's no way to do that. Oh, really? Oh, I'm but... sorry. If, if, if there's enough panning, I suppose, there you go. in a vertical video, you get that, and there's no lateral movement. Every time I thought there was no way to do something, Adobe's come out with a magic brush for it. Th- th- this would be a hilarious magic brush to yes. what we were talking about. Uh, this, unfortunately, is not that. Uh, but the examples they showed, for example, is uh, a skier going downhill, uh, skiing from the left to the right of the frame. Now, this is kind of a simple... Uh, ex- example of this this AI because you know it's high contrast one subject one piece of action very static landscape and very kind of boring landscape snow and mountains and so to just to lock in on that skier and crop around them I don't think is all that difficult the other example they showed was a woman playing uh, frisbee with uh, her dog and in this case it panned between them as the frisbee disc flew between them as if an operator, a camera op, moved the camera. And there you have some real AI going on because they're tracking not only the person, but also recognizing there is another object, like the disc, and then also a recipient of a disc, the dog, and then being able to go be- between them. That's kind of neat. Yeah. yeah I, I mean, all of the, both of the, the things they showed are still like essentially like one or two subject right. kind of video. So like the busy street kind of thing, uh, show me that, it working in that before I sort of totally believe. Would you watch Infinity War, like vertical now? (laughs) Just watch what it chooses to focus on. How dare you? (laughs) I I think the place where this is real application is in 360 video because there are some cameras now. You know, Insta has a new uh, Insta One X uh, camera that films in 360 and then you can export in one by one, 16 by nine, nine by 16, and it can use some subject tracking, but you as a user have to create those keyframes, right? You scrub through the video and you say, track on this subject, now track on this subject. But if you had all that data and ran it through an algorithm like the smooth operator, uh, that could be fully automated. And in that case, you do have full 360 information, all the information you theoretically would need to create a stable, interesting rectangular video. Mm All right. Uh, other things announced at Adobe Max, at least as we're recording this, uh, Photoshop on the iPad, built from the ground up for iPad, but with the full functionality of Photoshop as Photoshop users have come to expect. I it. mean, this is the big reason why Phil Schiller was at Adobe Max, was to make this announcement. Uh, finally, that's what I have to say. This is great. Is it a whole new UI? It is a no touch centric and pe- pencil focused UI. I, I part of me says great because part of me is like for people who love Photoshop and have been waiting for this, they they are they now have a tool that they all the experience they have of Photoshop can adapt for. And part of me is like a lot of things that you could do in Photoshop, you could do already now with existing mobile apps. Uh, maybe not in one singular mobile app, but I, it's more powerful from a um, from a just a, a market standpoint to get, you know, rather than satisfy the one million, maybe it's more than that, one million people who really love Photoshop to use on the iPad, but to enable the hundred million people who have iPads to get good at image editing and then like image editing without having to go through the That's rigorous not what this is. tutorial of Photoshop. But I think there's something to be said about how used Photoshop is and how this like combines with that ecosystem. Also now with, with the iPad Pro hardware and having something built from the ground up. And then when you layer on top of that the pencil, 
Like this is a great ecosystem for the Photoshop to exist as a useful app on the iPad. But again, I imagine a lot of artists useful, would love it. Useful for those that small percentage of artists who can actually leverage everything that Photoshop offers with the layers and and uh, yeah. And this is a, a like this isn't for everybody, but it's for graphic designers, artists. And, and like people that just use Photoshop on the reg. And I think that's not an insignificant number of people. It's not insignificant. And those people, since it's going to be built into Adobe Creative Cloud, they want those people to continue paying their $100, $200 a year. Oh, so you can't just get the app. Not as if they've been announced so far. Hmm. Um, and in the past, their mobile apps have been free. You can just download Lightroom. But they really, I think they're also pushing their cloud service. So if you pay for the subscription, you know, they presume that you'll be editing on both your tablet and a computer and or your Wacom or whatever, and you can edit there and your file gets saved to Adobe Cloud and then download it so you can do tweaks and edit on the go with the tablet. The only thing I wonder is how, if, if the transition from iPad back to desktop is going to be seamless with the some of the touch-enabled controls. If they're just sort of touch-enabled, that's fine. If there's actual functionality in the touch, that you don't get through the desktop. All that analog information, so many nuanced points of information with multi-touch. Uh, how many, what percent of people who own Photoshop you think use it for more than, or use it for just for like resizing? I think it's a, a huge number of people use Photoshop just for the most basic of basic functionality. Is like maybe all they use Photoshop for. And I think that's a, that's a huge mismatch, mismatch between potential of software like this and the appetite for people for, uh, out there for, for something so simple and efficient. And Photoshop is not that, neither simple nor efficient. Uh, Apple just acquired a new company this past week, um, a company, Dialog. Now, this is a company they've been working on in the past, uh, and mostly the technology that they care about is battery-related technology. It's, it's software and chips to analyze battery efficiency, not necessarily capacity, uh, but to, to better regulate how these batteries in our smartphones, which are, as we all know now, consumables. You're expected to kind of upgrade and buy those as they depreciate over a 1,000 cycles uh, to, to work in future phones. Yeah, this this isn't quite like a straight acquisition because they they garnered an acquisition stake or an equity stake in it, and then also put some capital down to support some specific manufacturing for Apple devices. Um, so it, it's sort of a, a double down on some of the, the semiconductor work that you, that you reference. Um, it it seems like this is really a, a play for for the phones, like about improving the user experience on the phones by the, through this or uh, whatever you want to call this infrastructure. Um, it's a little disappointing. I would rather there be news. I mean, you can't just manifest this happen that Apple, you know, bought a battery company that's making next generation batteries, but it just shows that there is no breakthrough in on the horizon that we know of in battery tech. And all we can do is hope that one chips are more power efficient in their consumption and two, that the software is smarter about how, those chips pull power, and that's in the near term how we're going to get more use out of lithium-ion, lithium-polymer batteries. Do you see any of the rumors about the next iPad? I thought that some of that was kind of interesting. It's supposed to come out. We're talking about the one that's supposed to be out in October, like, announced this, this month. Announced it. Or, or, like, which will come first, iPad or my baby? Exactly. That's what I'm wondering. That's, what, that's, uh, that's what exactly Baby. what I'm wondering. What if what if they came out on the same yeah. day? Yeah. How could you focus? I don't know. <laughs> I, I want to wait in line. Where should I be? The the rumors are that it will be USB C. Yes. Not just for you know communication, but also potentially to power a monitor. Because USB C has both data and power. Yeah. Um, that's interesting. A four K monitor powered by your iPad, and it will be a return to the. Wait wait wait. Hold hold on. Yeah sure. How, run your monitor or yeah. actually oh I don't know about like the actual power supply okay or but drive run, drive the images drive Got a it. 4k HDR monitor it's interesting so you know if they really want people to go iPad and not laptop yes they're right. gonna have to rethink how the keyboard attaches to the iPad then yeah 
I mean, well, any Bluetooth keyboard will work. Yeah. No, but I'm just saying, like, you know, they, uh, I, I think that that sort of hardware, the ergonomics of that entire endeavor is not sort of great yet. I know you can use a Bluetooth keyboard. Yeah. But it's still like, there's something about this, like the way laptops lay out I'm that is you. really comforting. I'm with you on that. I mean, we're talking about attaching to a monitor. You're also not necessarily talking about this as a laptop replacement. You're just talking about this as a media device, right? iPads being connected to TVs more than monitors, you know, 4K TVs for media streaming. And there's AirPlay for that, of course. But are you really talking about this as a laptop or a dock, essentially, yeah. using the USB-C cable to dock your iPad to a computer screen? As I, I don't see that happening. I don't think... Again, there'll be some use cases for some people, but it's that the the iPad isn't a, a laptop replacement at this it's point. It's not, and, and so much of the iPad is built on you touching the screen and all the apps. If yep. By plugging onto the monitor, it's just a display. Ah, Apple would have to release a touchscreen monitor for that. <laughs> no, they wouldn't. Why I mean, not? If because, only. Can I hold out hope for anything? I mean, I, I, we can all hold out hope. I'm hoping that they'll have a touchscreen Mac. The day yeah, Apple releases a touchscreen MacBook is the next time I'll buy a MacBook. There you go. Ultimatum. Yeah. Yeah. I, the, the money's burning a hole in my pocket. It's not. It's not at all. <laughs> um, Facebook updated its feed to support depth maps in photos in a kind of interesting way. Um, the, the information that you can take with your iPhone or your Pixel camera and, and the depth information that it gets used you know, on iPhone, notably for portrait mode, uh, can now be ingested by Facebook so that as you scroll through the picture, you can get parallaxing between the foreground and the background as you scroll through your feed. So it's not about launching a photo and then turning your phone to look behind the person, but as you scroll through a feed, you can now see the, the subject pop out of photos, and the effect is quite cool. No, no, no. I, I, mean, I was sort of caught off guard because a friend of Tested did this, and I'm friends with him on Facebook, Yeah, and I saw something from the cave um, in 3D. In 3D. Have you seen this, Jeremy? Is there a live demo? Oh, my goodness. I got to... I see a bunch of videos. I'll show you one. Give me a second. Because uh, even if you get the 3D data, you still only have two, like a one point in space's perception of the world. Oh, it, it doesn't try to fill in the back. And okay. it, it looks like that minority report... Um, so there's visualization. Gaps. You there's, see the gaps. You see the blurring. Okay. You see the 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 the, the edge of the person that kind of fades off. It's not a full 3D image, but it's more about it's as if you're looking into a shadow box image of a person, like as if yeah 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 the, you cut out the the front of the person and just create. But the hopefully depth. more than just three layers. Like it's a, it's a it's it a nice. It's mm, kind of like three layers. Oh like, really? Yeah. Here here. I can't see your monitor, <laughs> oh, Mr. Privacy. Wow, that's, I mean, that's cool. That's cool. As you're scrolling we're looking, through. We're looking at an image of Adam's Hellboy Mecha Glove in this sort of 3D. Can I try, can I, yeah. well, swipe? Yeah. You know, and you're only, you're again, loading the image and then rotating around it. The way it appears in the feed, though, I think is the. Yeah, because I, I get it. Is it. But I assume you'll be able to do this in the feed. It's just the feed grabs your attention. The f that's what it's very attention grabbing. See the eye of the bear is missing though. Like you, you should be able to see the bear's left eye, and you never do. Maybe I don't know. I'm just saying that there's certainly information that's not there. But it, th it that's fine. I like it. What's amazing is in this photo. Did you see the the mirror in the background? That is changing as well. Correctly. Okay. I believe so. I mean, I, I guess that makes sense because that Here. depth data would be mapped, yeah, mapped it should. correctly. Jeremy, check this out. I'm going to scroll through this feed for you. Mm -hmm. There you go. What was that? <laughs> 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 that was crazy. What is going on there? That, there Sorry. That's eye-catching. You, you stop. You grab my phone out of my hand. That's how it's using the depth data. <laughs> you're, you're getting trip. Jeremy's tripping. Wait. How come they don't all do that? It's only photos. Only that, photos that have the depth map. So what photos have the depth map? Take if you're taken with a portrait photographer. Uh, um, um, it's a portrait mode with the. Yes. I think it has to be with the Facebook app. Is that right? Um, let me check with that. Uh, I'm not sure exactly. It's definitely like yeah. It's phone. iPhone only. iPhone yeah. seven plus. Um and. Hmm. More phones in the future, and I guess they use some AI to do that as well. But I'm not sure if it's something you can upload from your photo roll or if you can uh, you have to take it with the, the Facebook. Guy. So um, uh, 
you can also see like that's video cool. of the depth map itself. Here you go. Yeah, I've done that with apps on the phone, and mm-hmm. that, that's fun to do. I'm gonna give you one more, Jeremy. It's that yeah, same yeah. one. So that's oh, how that's the one we're looking at there. Yeah. So as it, you pop in the feed, I mean, that's kind of <sighs> eye catching. Looks like a video. I mean, that's really neat. That's really neat. Okay, Facebook. Well done. Well done. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> that's really cool. Real time conversions uh, on the podcast. Um, right now. All right. Uh, wow. We only have like 20 or so minutes left in the podcast. Uh, big piece of hardware news this week, kind of out of nowhere. Hey, Palm phones are back. Palm this phones is, are weird, back. Man. They got money to get Steph Curry to, to shill for their Palm phone. This is a phone for your phone. Well, I thought the watch was the phone for your phone. <laughs> you know, That's a great way to put it. That, and that was the, the pitch, right? The new Palm phone, uh, if you may have heard, is a small form factor phone for Three hundred seventy-five dollars, four hundred dollars, essentially. Uh, that has very basic functions: runs Android, mail, maps, photos. There's a camera on the back, but it's tiny. It's almost credit card size, uh, thicker than a credit card, of course. Maybe it's like five or six credit cards stacked. But the idea is that you have this, and if you're on Verizon, I think it's exclusive to Verizon. It will share the same phone number as your primary phone. No one is expecting you to use this as your primary phone. I guess you could. <laughs> But you would have this as your secondary phone. So when you go camping or when you go on some activity or running, yeah. you don't need to carry your $1,000, $1,200 phone with all the distractions. You can just have this palm phone that you can put on a on an a arm bracelet. It's like a dinghy for your yacht. <laughs> right? Isn't it? <laughs> I guess so. <laughs> have it on a little tether just like following you. But on wheels, because sure is just I hate this world palming. so much. <laughs> It's a face palm so phone. So awful. That's funny. The, the uh, you know what? I thought it was a novel concept. I, there uh, for for point oh three seconds, I considered getting one, <laughs> and then I realized, you know, I, that's isn't that what your watch does? Yeah, I guess the uh, the Apple Watch does cost more, at four hundred dollars. But you could buy the watch, pay five dollars a month for the uh, cellular service, make phone calls on that, and just use that as your uh, distraction free. Phone for your phone. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there's literally a quote that says, like, this helps solve your second phone problem. Oh, my was, God. Oh, no. Third screen. It's time for fifth screen. Well, they don't have fifth screen here? Uh, if, when and if this, um, this whole idea just collapses, if it goes for, if it, the price drops to 100 bucks, I will buy one. It does seem like a hundred dollars kind of thing. That's exactly it. Goes, you're, you're also paying ten dollars a month extra already on, on the cellular, yeah, on the, on the service. If it was a hundred dollars, I would try it. Four hundred dollars, three to four hundred dollars, not not so much. Yeah, not so much. Uh, another phone news: Razer announced their second generation Razer phone uh, coming out in just a week, October twenty second. Um, they have better display on it. Some um, some better audio, uh, but once again, the big selling feature of the Razer phone is a 120 hertz LCD display, uh, and I don't know if we'll ever get that back from, from Apple, but I will say once again, I would love a high refresh rate yeah. display on a mobile phone. I'm sure, it's just battery. Yeah, yeah, and 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 having to do LCD as opposed to OLED. But if God, if that was the the killer feature on the iPhone uh, 10R, you the 10R, you don't like OLED can handle 120. I don't think I. Th- I think I ca- that's too much. Too hmm. much battery hmm. to drive that. Yeah, um, it, that's why the, the iPad. It's LCD that has it. The Razer phone. It's LCD. Hmm. Uh, but there is an LCD iPhone, high end iPhone coming out when, in the 10R, which we haven't heard a lot of. Right? What are the reviews for the 10R? Is it out yet? That, that, it's, it's, it must be out in like in a week or two. Yeah. Uh, so the reviews must be coming out soon. We'll talk about it next week. And then, um, uh, you know what? Yeah, let's make this one of our last piece, pieces of tech news. Winamp. 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 It's coming back. Making a comeback. How is it coming back? I actually don't even know this. I just saw that it was. So the people who own Winamp, and I guess um, AOL, mm-hmm. had, had Winamp, bought Winamp, but then a company, uh, Radionomy, Radionomy uh, bought Winamp four years ago, are developing a new front end for listening to music on your desktop and it will also be on uh, mobile devices um, and I, it might be for podcasts but also streaming radio and mp3s I feel like there's room in the market for that like the music player on the iPhone sucks iTunes blows um, there's only a few solutions that I really like that integrates 
streaming and podcasts um, with stuff from a music library. It's not really well done. So if this is actually something that operates between ecosystems, I think it would be could really hit it. But isn't the future streaming services? The yeah. present is streaming services. But if you have Spotify and you have a library and you want to listen to a podcast that's not on Spotify, you don't want to open up three different apps to listen to that. Do I think you? there's still a significant number of people who rip MP3s and keep them locally stored, even though streaming is way more convenient. Rip them from wait, what? Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Buy CDs, rip them, or download them. You do think that? We I spent that a bunch a... of time you complaining about the niche market for Photoshop on the iPad, and now you're talking about the people I'm that are ripping MP3s. I'm, I'm, I'm acknowledging. Not complaining. But yeah, this seems like that, though. A, a, a mobile app and desktop app to service those that... The smallest niche of people. Hey, as long as your old Winamp skins still apply. <laughs> I love those. Right? Yeah, I forgot about that. Everyone has a has a folder on their archive drive with their GeoCities webpage and their <laughs> collection of Winamp skins. Not everybody. Yeah, you can pull those <laughs> out and, and start applying them. Well, The novelty would be worth it alone. Um, all right, let's get one bit, bit of Tesla news. Uh, Tesla has now sold its 100,000th uh, Model 3. So many of them on the roads these days. You mean like 100,000 people have them? They, they've made 100,000. Wow. Yeah. Okay. And uh, they've uh, sold their 200,000 car, so the tax break is going to go away. But uh, they talked about that they have a new computer coming in. And this is a component in cars that people don't often think about is <laughs> the computer. The, the computer. Okay. No one talks about the computer. Even like people barely talk about the, the processing chips on. Um, on DSLRs, and those improve year over year. Those are a big part of um, the experience. Okay. And so uh, the current uh, Model S, X, and 3s have a, like this board, there's like a, you can see the image of it, right, with a chip um, that does some neural processing and does all the computer vision stuff, and there will be a new board that will be coming out within, we think, six months or so, based on Elon Musk's, uh, Elon Musk's tweets and... Um, and some images they've shown that will increase an order of magnitude uh, the performance of the, mm. uh, the computer vision processing. What does that mean? Fragmentation? Ah, so what Elon Musk says is that anyone who paid for the full self-driving on their Model 3 will get to get this as a free upgrade. You bring your car in. Oh, you need this. You need You this. did need new hardware. You need new hardware. Ooh. Yeah, you need new computer processing hardware. And guess who didn't get the full autopilot I didn't, upgrade? I didn't pay the full autopilot <laughs> upgrade. So if I wanted to do it, I would not only have to pay the extra $4,000, but I probably would have to pay for the new... I don't know if that would in, be included. I mean, this is a logistics nightmare. If you're talking about 100,000 cars potentially on the market right yeah. now, and they really want to get people to upsell, and they really... they It's in their interest for these to work well, one, right? They This must have been in their product pipeline this is a huge expense for them to upgrade the cars and for two a huge time commitment for the cars to be upgraded it's not the optional you know warranty you know warranty backed uh recall that you see in uh, but essentially is a recall for cars well for, for to, uh, to operate yes people, some people have paid that for, money for already those that have paid yes your car is getting recalled so that this feature can work that was not the promise that was not the promise that's right yeah, uh, but them making their own chips, it bodes well. I mean, like, it makes sense that this would be necessary because the, the car was designed, um, you know, years ago before they started making their own chips, and they'd hired a, uh, a chip architect from AMD to work on this. Did you install the new update? The new... Uh, I did. What is that, OS 9 or something? The version 9. Does it have V9. the Atari games? It does have the Atari games. I have not played them yet. Why not? I, Do you know how to find them? Yeah, yeah, oh, it's easy to find. It's easy to find. It's not all easy. Yeah. Why, are, why are we even on this podcast right now? Why aren't we playing video <laughs> games in your car? You can head to the parking lot across the street after the podcast, and we can play some Atari games. Yes. That was the le le least interesting part of the update for me. Well, we're all wired differently. Yeah. Uh, UI interfaces and um, the visualizations now uh, of uh, the cars around you, it's like Road Rash, but Tesla <laughs> edition, because you see motorcycles. I was driving on the freeway, and like three motorcycles drove by, and they popped up. As motorcycles? As motorcycles. People pop up. Pedestrians pop up now. Yeah. They don't walk. They look like just silhouettes just like sliding across the screen. Yeah. It's almost video game-like. 
course, the goal is to not hit them. Well, the car thinks it's a video game. The car absolutely thinks it's a video game. Yeah. So uh, the vi- big visualizations, some the UI changes for navigation, which I think are huge improvements. The web browser is in there now uh, for the Model 3, as well as a, a power um, a monitor for like the last 30 miles. So more, more telemetry. Uh, but yes, also the Atari game. And uh, can't it transition there. highways now? It can. I, I don't think I can because I don't I didn't right. pay for the full uh that might be only for full autopilot. But that's not enabled yet. It's true. It may be than any autopilot. I have not done the, the highway. We have much to do after this show. We, we, we things to test. Okay. Testing. No, not <laughs> wow, yet. that was weird. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, who hit the button? Uh, before we move on to our next segment, I want to thank the other sponsor that makes this episode possible, and that's uh, Lutron uh, Caseta Smart Lighting. Um, Caseta by Lutron Smart Lighting Control, brought to you by Lutron, is pioneer pioneers in smart home technology. With Caseta, you can schedule your lights to come on at dusk, so your family always comes back to a well lit home. And Caseta by Lutron takes your smart speaker, whether it's the Alexa, Google Home, Apple HomePod, and makes it more powerful by letting you control your lights with your voice. Caseta is the most connected smart lighting brand, and it works with more smart home devices than any other smart lighting brand, letting you pair lights with things like security devices, thermostats, and music systems like Nest, Sonos, and more. And because it's from Lutron, you can rest easy knowing it'll just work. We just finished building out our nursery and we have this system set up so no one has to get up from the rocking chair, from the glider to turn on the light and change the lighting in our nursery with this Caseta system. So get smart lighting the smart way with Caseta by Lutron. Search for Caseta, that's C-A-S-E-T-A, or check out Lutron.com to learn more. Caseta by Lutron. Welcome home. Peace of mind. Now it's time for a moment of science. Do you think about screen time and your kids? Yes, I do. You're already thinking about it, Norm? Mm, uh, screen time and me not the kids there's always been this uh this sort of back and forth in scientific literature about what's what's the right amount how do you do this there's actually a, a symposium going on right now about screen timing kids with a number of experts uh the journal pnas has put out sort of all of the the sort of highly regarded literature about screen timing kids and some of the conclusions have come out like this A, that's the wrong question to even ask because we're treating screen time as if there is one screen time and there's one use case for screens. People are using different screens for different reasons so they don't have all the same effects. So if you're using your screens to play video games constantly versus connecting socially with other people versus using it to multitask, there are going to be different impacts at that. And that's really hard to tease out. Um, What I garner from a lot of the conversations that seem to be ongoing is that it's going to be nearly impossible for science to ever come up with meaningful recommendations that can account for the variability with how we interact with screens. What's weird is that because of the complications, people have emerged with certain talking points about how much we should use our screens. So there is a number that's largely been bandied about in scientific circles that Two hours of screen time for kids is sort of the this I this area where above that it's considered high usage and below it's like it's you know more moderate usage. And but that number is not doesn't really mean anything. It's arbitrary. So uh but it's just hilarious to me. Two hours doesn't actually feel like a lot to no, me. No, it's not. Um, doesn't doesn't feel a lot to my son either. The variables, yeah. I mean, they need to be more definitive, and it needs to be properly tested. Because what does that even mean? Screen time, five inches away, ten inches away, you know, I, across I, the room at a TV. Is that considered screen time? I think it's how you are relating to the screen more than the distance from the radiative unit. I'm going to go on out on a limb. <laughs> I mean, I thought that's how you introed this whole thing. I I feel like that's that's obvious, isn't it? 
Yeah, like, but how do you tease it out? There's so many, like from a science perspective, it's really hard to tease out. I just want to highlight a couple things that have, have started to emerge. And there's a great article in ours that summarizes a lot of this data. There's still an ongoing debate about whether violent video games actually leads to greater aggression in kids. And there's still a number of studies that emerge that say, yes, there are some slight tendencies towards higher aggression in kids that play certain video games. I don't buy it. I just don't buy like the conclusion of that study. And it's not because of my own sort of um, uh, personal bias. It's just the, the, those studies are fraught with, um, uh, with uh, control issues and there's so much counter evidence to it as well. I think what is much more compelling is the multitasking effect, um, is the sense that our screens uh, I oftentimes are uh, make it possible for us to quote unquote multitask, but humans aren't terribly capable at actually multitasking. Um, the switching process um, it is a very energy intensive process for us. And so it's hard for us to focus on multiple tasks at the same time. And they, there are a lot of researchers out there that indicate that phones are exacerbating that problem that they lead to a type of paralysis in this multitasking effect. You don't think which they're helping in, possibly to train our minds to multitask? No. And like in some cases, um, people are, are suggesting, and I don't think this is, you know, causal necessarily. It's in a correl correlative effect um, that there's increased ADHD cases as a result of this constant switching that we're doing. Hmm. So how many hours is your son allowed to use the screen? No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, two other quick stories. There's an interesting uh, report out of the CDC. 65 people have come down with this type of virus that has polio-like conditions uh, that could that has led to a type of paralysis. Um, polio, which we've largely eradicated, um, but there are very few cases that have emerged uh, thanks to vaccines. Um, Ha in a small number of cases, about 1% of cases, if you got a polio, you could um, become immobilized, just like FDR was. Well, there's this uh, new virus. Well, it's not new. We've known about it for a little while called enterovirus D68. That is the possible culprit for this emergence of 65 cases in the U.S. where there is muscle control loss suddenly in arms and legs. It's terrifying. Um, what's going on. And right now, the CDC is sort of struggling to understand how these cases are developing going back to 2014. And even if there can be a vaccine developed against this particular uh, outbreak, it sort of sp um, how it spreads is still under investigation, but they think it's through saliva and mucus transmission. So it's not something that like will go, you know, anyone can just pick up anywhere. Um, but it's also we don't know what percentage, just like in polio, we know about 1% of the people are susceptible. We don't know why. Um, in this case, we don't know exactly why these people are susceptible to this polio-like condition. This, I think, just illustrates the, I, like, the importance of vaccines to me and also just how fragile um, all of this is and uh, all of our humanity is in the larger world of the viruses out there. Do they know who patient zero is? Uh, and why is he? No, and so... virus has been around for a little while. This this strain has been known about. So I don't hmm. think I've seen a report that indicates a, like any sort of patient zero type effect. Last story, uh, there's a lot of doom and gloom climate change reports that have come out um, with good reason. And there was a new study that came out in Nature Plants that pointed to barley production dropping by about 20%. Um, in the next 50 years. Oh, and, no, that's used for beer. Yeah, 83% of barley is used for feeding livestock, but 17% goes towards beer production. And if we lose about 20% of our production, uh, the price of beer will skyrocket. And then Climate change, sorry, finally livestock. hitting us where it hurts. No, actually, like the livestock actually pay more for the barley than oh, the beer distributors. What? The prioritization. All right, time for spirits. The VR Minute Virtual Reality This Week Sorry Any baby? No baby oh. No baby Shoot. No baby But still 
<laughs> corresponding because it's an apologies. It's a, <laughs> I have to I have to jump out to jump on a call, so All I'll right. leave mid VR minute. All right, All right. Uh, okay, Jeremy. Uh, we talked about Magic Leap Conference last week. You were not here for that conversation. Would you? Is there anything more that you, or anything you'd like to? Yeah. How ask many? Or how many about? people were present at Magic Leap Con? The PR people told me it was sold out, and it was about fifteen hundred people. That could include also uh, people who work there. Mm -hmm. So I think safe to say over a thousand people, up to fifteen hundred people. Did they say how many dev kits they sold? They did not not say how many dev kits they no sold. No idea, huh? Yeah, and did you? I know that you saw the Weta Workshop game. Yes, Doctor Gorg Grogbort's Invaders, because you included it in projections last week. Uh, did you see any other demos? I, uh, I did see an update to the Create app, uh, which is their in-house app that was used. Uh, if you watched our Magic Leap uh, review video, it's the one that you used to plop characters and decorate your house, uh, um, and they updated that to version one point one, which. Uh, is a new they added a new character an astronaut so for that to be a big deal and I'll talk to a developer about this is means that it's not easy for them to just add characters because they have to develop systems for how these characters interact with the other objects yeah not to mention the modeling animation and the modeling animation so it's not just like you know they have a whole library of like characters and here is like 50 characters every new character put in this is an update uh, but also that you know the dream of course is for this to be a persistent application where you can put fauna and characters all over your room while launching other applications. But in the categorization of AR apps and Magic Leap apps, this is what's considered a full screen application. So you launch this, it yeah. takes over everything. And unfortunately, uh, that's not how I would like to use the Create app. I know they mentioned the capability of using two controllers yes. being in the future, but you didn't see any None of that was shown examples there. of that. No, that was only a... a uh, a bullet point on the roadmap in okay. the future. Of course, we talked about this last week. This means nothing if they don't make this the standard skew. No. You know, support for two controllers is very different than two controllers being the new normal for Magic Leap. Did you, did you come away from the con with a sense of what is AR's immediate niche? Who's going to be using it first? God, it's a really good question. Uh, if, it, if, you're, if I was to believe just the people in the room, it was it's not... They believe, I mean, everyone talked about that they want, you know, to put people, characters in a room and telepresence. I don't think that's going to be AR's killer app. None of this felt like AR's killer app to begin with. You don't think it's games, do you? I, I mean, games will be a big part of it, just like VR. Mm -hmm. But I don't think VR's killer app is... But gamers are buying VR headsets. Y they're, yes. They're not buying Magic Leap. Yes, and gamers are bare, a subset of gamers are buying exactly. VR headsets. And VR headsets cost hundreds of dollars, whereas Magic Leap costs over a thousand. Over two thousand dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Um the game is the game's the I mean, Doc, Invader is a super polished and it proves the point that games in AR can be really fun and really immersive and there's really powerful. Uh it is still a very solitary experience. Yeah. Uh, watching someone play it is not f fun. But that gives them room to do things like your iPad style AR. And I think one of the fears I have is for Magic Leap as a company is that there is no, they're so money focused and creative energy focused on their platform, their hardware, that I don't see them, at least they haven't announced any diversifying of the experiences onto iPads, desktop computers, mm -hmm. uh, the asynchronous, or no, sorry asymmetrical experience. I got that wrong last week. So somebody uh, can look at an iPad and exactly. see what you're seeing in that AR. That would be the stepping stone. Like we saw at Dead and Buried. Like we at saw OC with 5. VR. And VR is not even, it hasn't embraced that yet. But we are seeing that not only with Dead and Buried, but also with Alchemy Labs, with Google uh, right. AR Core. They had that example. Um, and that, I think, is an important step for both VR and AR. And I, I don't think we're there yet. Um, and still no talk of a consumer edition, no, no price. No. Okay. No. I mean, I, I think I, I said this last time, I'd be happy if the consumer edition was this hardware with two controllers and dramatically reduced price. I don't know where the cost is. Are they making margin on this? Is it because they, haven't, they don't have logistics figured out and this isn't at, it's done at scale? Uh, but if they reach that Oculus moment where this is, you know, I'd be happy. 500 bucks? I, I would love that too. But I yeah. would also be perfectly happy if they waited a year. Or even more, maybe oh, yeah. a, a, a year and a half. The, they're racing let against. The, let the devs do what they need to do. Let things c cook for a while. They're racing against Apple. Is I think the the kind <laughs> of the undertone. Is Did that, that come up? No one mentioned it. No one, had, you know, in presentations or anything. But I think there was a feeling that like they have this 
ability to show AR now, and yeah. that's super cool, yeah. as you and I have known using things like HoloLens and, and Magic Leap. But the moment Apple has something similar, they just don't have the developer numbers. Apple has developer numbers working with AR Kit right now. Even Google has developer numbers working in AR Core with no obvious plans to put an AR headset out. Yeah. 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 So it's a tough place. I mean, they have a lot of money. And um, I, I, I wish them the best. I, I would love to see. Like, this, these are exercises and these are um, experiments that need to happen in AR. It's too bad more people won't be able to play this game. I know, right? Like, and it's not a game that works well with pass-through AR. Like, this is a game where really, like, being able to see through optically the, your space mm-hmm. um, really helps the game. Because suddenly there's... A portal here, and suddenly you're looking at your wall, and there is a room size, you know, a wall size portal into another world that is visually convincing. Maybe it'll come to whatever popular headset is out in five years. Yeah, yeah. Uh, on to other VR news. Uh, Six Sense, uh, makers of the STEM system of tra- positionally tracked controllers, which also use uh, um, magnetic fields for their six off tracking, uh, is issuing refunds <laughs> to all their <laughs> Kickstarter backers what? after delays. With interest? No, no interest. So this was a Kickstarter that launched five years ago this month, I think. Like yeah. October of, what, 2013? Yeah, this was uh, on the heels of the Oculus DK1. Right, yeah, that Kickstarter, which I don't even, had that launched, even started shipping before this Kickstarter? I don't think so. And because and they didn't need to. The timing was right for them because they had the technology already. They used it. For, they licensed the Razer for the Hydra right. controller. And... This made perfect sense, but like, of course... With the DK1, it didn't even have any kind of tracked controller. So the yeah. fact that you could track anything in 6 off was outstanding. Yeah. So, of course, they succeeded in their Kickstarter and um, like by several hundred thousand dollars, and then they just never shipped. Yeah, so they're going to refund every backer, including uh, fees, um, uh, and all done through uh, PayPal. And so uh, there should be an update on the STEM Kickstarter. Um, it's kind of disappointing. My question was, how can they afford to do this? Because it is, the, I, f- I forget what their Kickstarter was. I could look it up, but it was over a hundred thousand dollars. It was not chump change. It was, it was like several hundred thousand. Several, dollars. several hundred. Uh, oh, the Kickstarter. Yeah, uh, six hundred thousand dollar. Yeah. So uh, apparently they partnered with a, another company earlier this year to the tune of twenty million dollars. So they have a nice cash injection that they can use to do this. So good on them for making that a priority. I don't know what next step is for them then. Um, they're trying to do uh, more B2B stuff. Yeah, yeah. I don't yeah. know, you know, if there's a market for it. Uh, speaking of the next steps for early VR companies, Jaunt, which uh, made its name developing cameras uh, for 360 video, uh, is now moving away from 360 video, unfortunately closing down the shop uh, and moving toward what they say AR content, which is a nebulous way of saying that we're moving to the next thing. Um, it's unfortunate. I think that there's still a lot of interest in 360 video. I don't think 360 video, and especially stereoscopic 360 or 180 video, has reached its peak for creativity. Um, but you know, there clearly wasn't a big business in it. Yeah. Well, not yet. Not yet. I think the, the Oculus Go would have helped that, and certainly, you know, Quest next year will I, help that. I think it's all about getting that volumetric data. Yeah, you know, getting that cloud, that point cloud, and being able to do what Facebook is doing with your scroll. That's right. If you Depth could data. just, if you could just move your head a little bit in those uh, 360 videos or 360 photos, that would make a world of difference. I mean, that that that's a real. And Facebook's already processing depth data with, you know, uh, rectangular photos through its AI. There's mm-hmm. no reason they couldn't also. You know, it would take engineering work, but to apply that on on uh, 180, 360 video as well. Echo Arena is getting a Halloween update. I thought they would be doing a couple of moats, maybe pl- put a pumpkin <laughs> in there, a jack-o'-lantern. Have you seen this this video? I saw the video. It's neat. Smoke, you got, you got some uh, dry ice fog coming out of the water. I mean, uh, they've you, rethemed the entire environment. It, got, it, it's a pretty big deal. So it looks cool. I mean, if you're clown an Echo... doors. Wow. How about spend that resource on getting the, the game out? Echo Combat. They've committed, man. That's one month away. Oh, my You're goodness. going to get that. The flamingo is in there. Is it in the Flamingo the toss is in there. There's a mention oh, of the flamingo and neon lights. Uh, it's cool. I, I, we love Ready, Ready at Non, and um, it, it's great. It, it shows that this, there's a strong community out there in Echo Arena, and they'll all like this. But I, I just want Echo Combat. Yeah. This reminds me of when I was first playing World of Warcraft, and they did, I forget what they call a fair, but it's every year around Halloween time, and they theme the entire world. It, that does a lot for community building. Yeah, yeah, totally. 
Uh, and then uh, finally, Rec Room has an update. Uh, now there is bowling. Yeah, they teased it. Like we saw the 50s, 60s era Art Deco stuff, and then sure enough, it is bowling. Uh, it's uh, You join, I think you're in a group of four, and uh, it's straight up bowling. You grab a ball, you throw it down the lane, you hope that those pins, but you don't have to throw it underhand if you want. You can chuck a ball down there. Does this seem regressive in some way? Playing, playing bowling in virtual reality? Bowling in virtual reality in that, that that was like the first thing that was exciting with motion controllers, with the Wii. Because of, of Wii Sports. And really, I felt like we've moved beyond bowling as a track, as, as the, the thing to do in tracked controller gaming. They didn't delete Rec Royale. They didn't get rid of the quest. This is additive. So it's not regressive. It's just another thing you can do. Once again, I'll say, where's the where's the next quest? Right. It's like weeks away. I right. Yeah. The, is it Halloween theme. Yeah. It's spooky, right? Yeah. Yeah. So let's we'll get back. Oh God, quest first or baby first? We <laughs> we played when I was in Seattle. Um, I brought my go, and that's it oh turns, yes. That turns out that's when I use it. Is when I'm on vacation. With family. Get I, away from your family. I vacation really from like family. it. I really like to go when I'm not at home. When I you know, have a, mm-hmm. a need to escape. And Did you I'm use on the train? Surrounded by people. I tried to, but my c- remote, the controller would not connect. What? It took me a whole day of trying of doing different button combinations. Yeah. I know the combination to resync, but yeah. I couldn't even get the LED on the controller to turn on. Oh. I took out the battery several times. Eventually, it started working. Hmm. I even wrote support and I like, asked for a new remote. Right. Anyway, I got it working. Uh, we tried, uh, what is it called? Cloudlands mini golf. For whatever reason, we couldn't get your VoIP working, but we were in the same world. And that was, that was a fun experience. Golf, mini golf with three doff yeah. is limiting, but well, not impossible. It's teleport based and it does map the head movement and the wand movement in VR so I can see you moving. So there's a human a- aspect to it. Like Avatars. A, yeah, and I, I enjoyed that. And But the actual putting is locked in and you're only doing one motion, which actually makes it real easy. Because yeah. you're just lining it up and all you're doing is applying force. Yeah, it's a little bit like a pool game or something, yeah. billiards. Yeah. But, you know, at least the the final swing is an analog of your hand. I just wish I could walk around. I, there's yes. a button you press to... Uh, on the, the pad to lock you into the, the putting ready position. Yes. And I want to be able to walk around and use, you know, come from any angle. I hear you. Um, yeah. But it works. It's up to four players. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of maps. And, and then, you know, when we couldn't get the VoIP working, we jumped into Oculus. Went, rooms. Like, rooms. That's what they call it. And for whatever reason, we hadn't jumped in there before. And uh, we played Boggle. Boggle. That was actually kind of fun. Boggle was fun. And the VoIP in there... Is not only it work functional, but it uh, it's spatially yes. you know, accurate. Yes. So I hear you coming from wherever you are in in which 3D is trippy. Space. Which is it's, it's great. Yeah. And so and the boggle is actually a lot of fun. You you point and you draw and you have one minute to make as many words as you can based on a bunch of die that are uh, letters in in front of you. All of that will be much more interesting once they have mirroring, screen mirroring, and people are able to share these experiences. Yeah, man. Like the um, iOS update that came out a couple weeks ago said it was in there. Like yeah. the iOS app is ready. They just have to unlock it. Unlock it on the hardware. Come on. On man. that encoding. Bring it. Uh, so that does it for VR news in the uh, VR minute. Um, and that I think does it for this episode. Um Things on the site this week, we have uh, a new series, Bits to Atoms, The Making of Star-Lords. Oh, that's a good one. And reception's been great. This is a seven-part series where, Jeremy, you and Sean uh, work with our friends at Other Ocean Entertainment, Other Ocean Interactive, mm-hmm. Mike Micah, who's been a guest on this podcast before. A couple times. And, uh, and Kevin Wilson, mm-hmm. uh, both uh, stand-up guys and also just coding wizards. They made the software from scratch for your arcade cabinet. And if you had been following us on Twitter, you saw that these photo, uh, their key cabinet um, made its appearance at California Extreme this year. And the whole making of this cabinet from design to collaboration to problem solving is documented uh, and will be rolling out. And for, the first episode's out right now. For Tested Premium members. Yes, yes, uh, Tested Premium members. And uh, we uh, also, for Premium members, an update, uh, this year's member gift is um, in production right now. We're going to be unveiling it in about a week or so. Uh, but it is another poster. It's another piece of art from Adam. So um, sign up if you haven't signed up already to get that and also to watch the series. What's one, one small clue about what the art is? It's space-themed. Hey, there you go. I'm on board. 
All right. Um, and that does it for us this week. Who's our outro from? Um, oh, this <laughs> Aussie Muso. The title is Norm Sings. Have we done this one? Oh, no. Yeah, let's see what this is. Oh, I'll, uh, I'll unmute it before I play it. No, go back. Oh, my God. Hi there. I didn't see you. Test it. Do you think it's okay to drive stone? Stone, I stone, stone. Get a DUI. Stone, 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 stone. Do not get behind the wheel. Stone, that's it. We had that last week, Jeremy. We should do that every week. Oh, no. That's really good. No, <laughs> I can't control because I won't be on the podcast next month. All right. Uh, thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Bye.